Okay, good to go. Have a good session. Okay, hello everyone. So welcome to the isogeny based cryptography session uh, at Azure Crypt. So uh, the session will consist of uh, six talks uh, about isogeny based crypto. And the first one is entitled uh, Cryptographic Group Actions and Applications by uh, Navid Almaty, Luca Defeo, Hart Montgomery, and Sikar Patranabis. And Sikar will give the talk. So sorry for my pronunciation if it's incorrect. Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. So this talk is titled Cryptography Group Actions and Applications, and this is joint work with Navid, Luca, and Hart. So let's begin by recalling what the crypto universe looks like in the computational setting. So we have the world of Minicrypt, where one-way functions exist, Cryptomania, where public key encryption exists, and the crypto dream world of Fastopia, where indistinguishability obfuscation exists. Now, over the past several decades, cryptographers have attempted to validate the existence of these worlds by instantiating them from concrete computational assumptions. So these concrete hardness assumptions, in some sense, act as the crypto atlas for these worlds. In some more detail, cryptomania typically consists of many rich public key crypto primitives, and these have been built from many different assumptions. Now, the state of the art looks something like this. A very large number of public key primitives with rich functionalities have been built from Diffie-Hellman assumptions, factorization assumptions, and more recently, from lattice-based assumptions. Unfortunately, not similar amount of progress has been made in building such a rich set of crypto primitives from code-based or isogeny-based assumptions. So in some sense, these are not yet mainstream cryptographic assumptions. Now, why is this not a good state of affairs? Because it is well known that the constructions based on Diffie-Hellman or factorization assumptions are not post-quantum secure. And given the recent advances in lattice cryptanalysis, it is perhaps unwise to put all our crypto eggs into one single post-quantum bucket. In other words, it is an interesting and perhaps important question to diversify the set of plausibly secure post or post-quantum secure assumptions from which we can build rich crypto primitives in cryptomania. In this work, we make progress in this direction. In particular, we show new constructions of many public key primitives from certain isogeny based assumptions. Our main contribution can be summarized in three simple words, isogenies for dummies. In particular, we propose a very simple and abstract framework that allows you to build cryptography from certain isogeny based assumptions without necessarily being an expert in all the underlying mathematical details. The hope is that the broader cryptography community, even if not familiar with all the intricate details of isogenies, would be able to use this framework to build many rich crypto primitives from these isogeny based assumptions. The main technical tool that we use is called cryptographic group actions. These are commutative and regular group actions that we endow with certain natural cryptographic hardness assumptions. I'll focus on two main assumptions here. The first one is a weak pseudo-randomness assumption, and this is very similar in flavor to the very well-known decisional Diffie-Hellman or DDH assumption. And the second assumption is a new assumption that we introduce in this work called the linear hidden shift or LHS assumption. To the best of our knowledge, this particular assumption has not been studied before in the context of either cryptography group actions or in the context of isogenies. The main, I, I would refer to the, to the paper or to the long version of the talk for the technical details of these assumptions. But the main takeaway is that once we endow cryptography group actions with these assumptions, it turns out that we can actually build many rich public key primitives from them. Our abstractions are specifically to design to capture the limitations of isogeny based assumptions as compared to say Diffie-Hellman assumptions. And this whole framework can actually be instantiated from C side and its derivatives, such as CFISH. Here is a quick summary of our main results. As already mentioned, we, cons we consider cryptography group actions with two main assumptions, the weak pseudo randomness assumption and the linear hidden shift assumption. We show that cryptography group actions endowed with weak pseudo randomness assumptions can be used to build many interesting primitives such as universal and smooth projective hash proof systems, dual mode public key encryption, and statistically sender private two message oblivious transfer protocols in the plane model. We also show 
that cryptography group actions endowed with the LHS assumption can be used to build key dependent message CPA secure symmetry key encryption. Now, if all of this sounds very alien to you and you're wondering why we should care about these primitives, it is because we can invoke a number of results from previous years to say that weak pseudorandom group actions can therefore be used to build CCA secure public key encryption in the standard model, round optimal maliciously universally composable secure OT and multi-party computation protocols in the common reference setting, non-malleable commitments, and a number of other very interesting and powerful crypto primitives. Similarly, we can invoke another set of previously known results to say that if a cryptography group action is endowed with both the weak pseudorandomness and the LHS assumption simultaneously, then we can build even more primitives, which includes key dependent message CCA secure public key encryption, trapdoor one-way functions, and designated verifier non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. By instantiating our framework from Seaside and its derivatives, we get the first plausibly post-quantum secure constructions of these primitives from isogeny-based assumptions. There are a couple of things that I would like to highlight here. The first being that the only other post-quantum or plausibly post-quantum secure constructions of these, of these primitives are from lattice-based assumptions. And secondly, our constructions are more in the feasibility style we, do not, we did not really care about the efficiency of the resulting primitives. So it is possible that there are more efficient construction of these primitives from either our framework or from other uh, isogeny-based assumptions. Our work gives rise to many interesting open questions. Of course, the first and the most obvious one is that what else can be built from our framework? There are many popular crypto primitives that are frequently used, but we could not build them. This includes collision resistant hash functions, single server private information retrieval and other forms of public key encryption, which are with fine grained access control, such as attribute based or predicate encryption. And it's a very interesting and challenging question as to whether such uh, primitives can be built from uh, cryptographic group actions. The second question is whether there are other natural cryptographic assumptions that we could end up on top of these group actions and whether that could potentially allow us to build more applications. And finally, Another interesting question is whether similar easy to use plain abstractions can be built for other isogeny based assumptions that are not currently captured by our framework. This includes SIDH, Psych, and some of the more recently proposed isogeny based assumptions. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. So we already have a question in the chat. Um, Devika Sharma asks, do you have a candidate group action that satisfies those two uh, assumptions? I guess uh, the, the claim is that uh, the, the seaside uh, setting provides this, right? Yes, exactly. So the seaside setting provides this, and I would encourage you to look into the paper for some justifications that we have on why we think these assumptions are plausibly post-quantum secure. Thanks. Uh, so don't hesitate. Uh, if you have any other questions. So in the meantime, um, I have one. So can, can you clarify to, so what specific uh, limitations of uh, Seaside, for example, uh, you were um, trying to work around by designing those assumptions? Thanks, that is a great question. So um, one, of the, one of the main difficulties in trying to replicate constructions from the DDH setting to the setting of group actions or seaside in particular is that uh, the group actions typically have a group and a set and the set is typically unstructured and doesn't have any algebraic properties. Uh, this is one of the reasons, this is one of the biggest drawbacks or I would say one of the biggest limitations that we had to work around. Of course, with respect to in particularly with respect to seaside, there are certain other drawbacks uh, and we have certain restricted definitions uh, in our um, paper, uh, which actually take into account those drawbacks as well. For example, in C side, the group action is not efficiently computable for any uniformly random group and set element. And we have certain restrictions that take this into account. But I would like to point out, however, that all our constructions also uh, are valid even with those workarounds or restrictions. Thank you. Is there any other question? Looking at the... Zulip chat, uh, it doesn't look so. So um, thank you very much. Let's move to the next talk. Uh, so the next talk is uh, B-side, uh, super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman using twisted torsion uh, by Craig Costello. And uh, Craig is giving the talk.
Yeah, can you hear me there, Medi? Yep. All right. Where are we? Okay, so um, this is a this is an idea that I uh, came across somewhat accidentally when I was trying to prepare a um, a tutorial uh, a little over a year ago. Um, turns out some other people had had the same idea before me. I think Lucas in the in this chat he had the same idea, and uh, I know of at least one other person that had the same idea, but. Um, they were either not optimistic or not stupid enough to take it seriously um, or to maybe Luca was writing too many other papers to, to bother writing this down. But uh, I, I kind of want to revisit uh, the accident and what, uh, what gave rise to the paper or at least what gave rise to the idea. Um, so I was trying to, uh, I'd been busy kind of plagiarizing pictures from other people's talks for a while and I thought it's time to draw my own um, super singular isogeny graph in a tutorial talk which is uh the gif that you see on screen so it's kind of like a pictorial depiction of um a real mini sidh protocol so it's working over the prime uh 431 which kind of has except for not being large enough it kind of has all of the right characteristics of uh primes that we would actually use in practice um so it's like two to the i times three to the j minus one um, so the first thing I needed to do after asking Magma to spit out all of the super singular J invariants over that uh, prime characteristic, uh, the first thing to do was to go around each of the nodes um, to, if I was drawing Alice's graph, I needed to find some two torsion points. And if I was drawing Bob's graph, I needed to, to find some three torsion points and to start drawing the edges between the nodes to see which nodes are connected to which edges and so on. Um, and I started to run into trouble when I was looking for two and three torsion points on those red nodes. Um, so some of the red nodes there, or all of the red nodes were, for whatever reason, I couldn't find points of order two and three. And started to think, what the hell's going on here? Um, these things are all, these are uh, all elliptic curve. Uh, these are all J invariants that are super singular. And the elliptic curves that Magma is spitting out, they're all isogenous to each other because they're in this uh, connected isogeny graph. Um, so what the hell's going on? So then to, if I couldn't find points of order two and three, I thought, okay, let's at least, um, look at the group orders of these J invariants and magma's elliptic curve, uh, magma's elliptic curve from J invariant function had actually been randomly, uh, spitting out, um, either one group order or the other. Uh, so uh so all of the ones in green magma was spitting out an elliptic curve over fp squared that had uh, group order p plus one all squared and over um, all of the ones in red it was spitting out an elliptic curve that had group order p minus one all squared so i was confused for a second and then uh realized what's actually going on um and that is that the whole time we've been doing sidh and psych um and kind of related related isogeny based protocols we've been uh we've been naturally just choosing one or the other uh, group order to work with. So we've been defining our primes in this way, um, like the, the prime 431, so that we can work uh, over the, the P plus one torsion and, and all of our two and three power torsion is, is rational. Um, and that was, that was all fine, but uh, what's actually going on here is that nodes in the super singular uh, isogeny graph, they don't actually, um, or they don't have to correspond to, to one group order or the other. They, in fact, um, they can be represented by uh, curves that have either group order. So these nodes shouldn't be thought of as being red or green. They should be thought of as being, um, as being able to be represented by elliptic curves that either have group order P plus one all squared or group order P minus one all squared. Um, and so then I started to think, okay, well, maybe, uh, maybe trying to force Alice and Bob to both work in the P plus one torsion is um, somewhat restrictive. And instead we could let say Alice work in the P plus one torsion and, and Bob work in the P minus one torsion. So that's essentially the whole idea of, of B side. Uh, so there's Alice, she's going to work with the same set of nodes as Bob, but she's going to take points uh, and uh, isogeny 
uh, kernel subgroups whose orders divide P plus one. And there's Bob working with the same set of nodes, but he's going to work on the B side. I'm calling it the B side because it's, um, it's like BSIDH, but it's also kind of an analogy to the, to the forgotten flip side of a record. We, in all of the primes we've chosen to instantiate SIDH and psych, we've, um, no one's ever really chosen to do uh, P, to look at the torsion torsion points of of order dividing p minus one, um, and so let's look at what happens when we do this. When Alice and Bob no longer need to um, when their when their subgroup orders no longer need to divide p plus one, um, now we're just going to take Alice's isogeny degree to be m and Bob's isogeny degree to be n. Um, and of course, P plus one and P minus one only have the factor two in common and then whatever's left is co prime. Um, now, ideally, because we know that two and three power isogenies are the most inf efficient in practice, um, smoother isogenies are, are more efficient in practice. Um, ideally, we'd love M and N to be two and three powers as before, but unfortunately the largest uh, prime number that, uh, for which M and N can be two and three powers is 17. Um, and so if we want a cryptographically sized prime, um, where M and N, uh, if we want a cryptographically sized prime, then turns out we have to relax the condition of M and N being two and three powers. In fact, you can't, you can't have M and N being prime powers for any common, for any fixed primes. Now, what we're going to have to do is take M to be a product of, uh, an arbitrary prime power and N to be the product of a different arbitrary prime power. Um, and it turns out that finding, uh, finding primes that lie between two, um, two really smooth numbers is, is kind of non-trivial. Um, at, at least in, in the, the B side, the original paper, I, I gave a few methods of trying to search for these things. Um, I know that the best paper at this conference or one of the best papers, Ski Sign, also requires a construction similar to this. Um, where a prime is is lying between two uh, almost well two two numbers that have uh, really smooth factors, um, large smooth factors. Uh, but then in in more recent work, we came up with a um, uh, with Michael Meyer and Michael Narig, we came up with a, a much better way to to find these um, these primes that lie between large smooth numbers. So. Uh, I refer to that more recent ePrint uh, if you'd like to take a look at the details. Uh, it turns out we can't get nearly as close to two and three smooth, but we can get um, in this example, both of these P plus one and P minus one are um, two to the 15 smooth, which is as far as I know, as good as, as good as uh, has been seen at this kind of size to date. I think the P here is 250 bits. So now um, the only kind of well one of the only real differences as far as the um as far as the protocol goes and the arithmetic goes nothing changes so um one of the really nice things that happens is alice and bob can kind of do um optimal montgomery um arithmetic just like they did before and because this arithmetic doesn't pay attention to whether you're working on the um on the curve or its quadratic twist uh Alice and Bob can just compute isogenies just like they, they would before. Um, and so the, the only real kind of, uh, well, one of the two kind of security conjectures that it's made in this, in this work is that, uh, it's okay for Alice and Bob now that they're not, they're not just computing one, uh, one prime power or, or, uh, uh, a prime power isogeny where there's only one prime, um, so they're not staying in one L isogeny graph. They're going to say compute uh, an L equals, let's say five isogeny. And then after they choose one of those six neighboring nodes, they're going to switch to a different prime, compute that isogeny um, and, and so on. And so the conjecture here is that as long as the number of kernel subgroups is roughly the same um, as it is in SIDH and psych, then um, the hardness of the of the isogeny problem is is as hard. Um, so the the conjecture that I write down the bottom is roughly speaking that the hardness of the problem depends on the size of L and not on its factorization. Just one slide to compare the security of of uh, SIDH and B side. Um, 
and so what what we've got here if we no longer have to force alice and bob to both have their co-prime uh, subgroup orders dividing p plus one we can lower p so that it's um so that it's close so that both of their isogeny degrees is is you know one is p p plus one over two and one is p minus one over two whereas in sidh um the isogeny degrees are, are roughly the square root of the prime that you have to that you have to deal with. So, I've kind of fabricated two like toy isogeny graphs here to to, to give a depiction of what's going on. But uh, so on the left in in SIDH, you've got uh, Alice or Bob starting on the red node, and their set of destination nodes that they can that they can land at after computing their secret isogeny is um, O of uh, square root the size of the graph, um, and so kind of uh, generic uh, generic algorithms for solving the isogeny problem um, are not as good as as special algorithms that that target uh, the special problem that's going on here um, on the other hand in B side you've so, got sorry, Craig, yes. Craig I, I will have you to ask you to, to conclude pretty fast okay uh, yeah. see the see the longer talk online if you uh, if you want to uh, dig into the security details here. I'll just jump to the last slide. Um, the pros, I'm being biased here, but the pros are uh, the potential for smaller public keys. Um, you don't have to do compression anymore. You get nothing out of, of compression like you do in SIDH. Um, the security analysis is um, arguably cleaner than SIDH and psych and certainly of other post-quantum primitives. Um, and the, if you do the hybrid in the way that, that we suggest using the same underlying field then your classical security basically matches the security of uh the classical ecc security matches the uh classical and kind of quantum levels of security of of b-side uh the cons which i've put as future work is the efficiency um some recent work that's on the archive there that's really nice shows that the efficiency of b-side is better than i thought it was going to be um but hopefully future work can make it even faster and maybe even supersede sidh and psych Okay, sorry for running over, Mehdi. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so we are running a bit over time. So I think it would be best uh, if uh, we take questions offline or uh, in the event that uh, we have a bit of time at the end of the session, maybe you can take them at that time. So let's move to the next talk. Uh, entitled uh, Calamari and Falafel, uh, Logarithmic Linkable Ring Signatures from Isogenies and Lattices by uh, Ward Bulens, uh, Shuichi Katsumata, and uh, Federico Pintore. And Shuichi Katsumata is going to give the talk. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction uh, again. So this is a joint work with Ward Bulen and Federico Pintore, and uh, she will be giving a talk. So our result in one slide is that we propose a simple and efficient generic construction of OR proofs uh, based on simple algebraic structures. And how simple are these algebraic structures at a very high level? There are basically group actions. And since they're group actions, we can uh, get these OR proofs from isogenies and lattices. And using the known transform of OR proofs to ring signatures uh, using the Fischer transform, uh, what kind of uh, we get a ring signature where the signature size scales with logar logarithmically in n, where n is the number of users, and the order hidden in this log n is actually very small. It's only a small constant, c times two times the security parameter, where c you, uh, you can think of it as being as small as thirty. And by instantiating this uh, whole generic uh, protocol using isogenies and lattices. Uh, we get two concrete schemes, which we call Calamari and Falafel. So Calamari is the one based on isogenies, and it has the smallest signature among all the uh, post-quantum schemes. And Falafel is the one based on lattices, and it has a fast signing algorithm compared to Calamari. And it has a smaller signature size per, uh, compared to the previously smallest lattice space schemes for users uh, more than 1,000. So let me get into the background on OR proofs. So theoretically, uh, getting an order log and proof is actually very easy using Merkle trees. Uh, you can get it generically. 
However, uh, the order hidden in this order notation is very large. It's a very large uh, poly polynomial in the security parameter. So it might actually be very impractical if you want to instantiate this in practice. So this uh, brings us to our motivation. So we want an alternative practical generic construction for OR proofs. And this is the problem that we uh, tackle in this work. So we, I don't have enough time to explain the whole details, but let me try to explain the very high level idea. So as a preliminary, I just want to show the famous sigma protocol for graph isomorphism. I hope that everybody knows this um, to some extent, so I won't get into detail, but there are two graphs, uh, G and H, and this uh, random isomorphism between G and H is the, the witness right now. And how does this sigma protocol work? So we commit to a random graph and we either open to this randomness or we open to this path. And if we can show both of these paths, then we can extract uh, this, this isomorphism. So this is actually zero knowledge and it's special sound. So the starting point of our work is to extend this to a two statement or proof. So now we have one graph, one base uh, graph G and there's two graphs H1 and H2. And let's assume we're prover one, which has this witness isomorphism phi one here. And he doesn't know what this phi two is. And he wants to prove that he knows phi one without leaking the index one. So what are we gonna do? We are first gonna commit as in the uh, one statement setting. And then we're gonna uh, add a permutation here, a random permutation. And we're just gonna swap these graphs in a random order. And we're gonna send this uh, random graph in this randomized order. And what is the verifier going to ask? So when C equals one, when the challenge is zero, I'm oh, sorry, when the challenge is zero, uh, the prover is just going to reveal that he created these commitments correctly. So he's going to open to these two isomorphisms and this random permutation. And obviously this is going to be independent of this index one. And when the challenge is one, what we're going to do is that the prover is just going to reveal this whole path. So starting from G, it's going to output an isomorphism that maps to this random graph R. And since we added a random permutation, this doesn't, this end graph does not leak the index. So this is actually index hiding again. And we can show that this uh, sigma protocol is two special sound and zero knowledge. So this is our inefficient base protocol for end statements. It, just generalizes very easily to the end statement setting. So, and uh, as you can see, this is a very generic protocol in the sense that it works for any algebraic structure. It doesn't have to be grass isomorphisms. And in particular, it works as long as it's a group action with some cryptographic notion on top of it. And we can instantiate from isogenies and lattices. So the remaining question is, why is it, why was it inefficient and what can we do with it? So, First of all, it's inefficient because the prover has to send all these random uh, commitments and there's N of this. So it scales with the number of user N right now. And also when C equals one, when the challenge is, I mean, sorry, but when the challenge is zero, we have to open to all these randomness. And again, this scales with N. And finally, since the challenge space is zero one, we have to do a lot of power repetition to amplify soundness. So the remaining question is how do we make it to order log N? And I won't have time to explain how we actually achieve our end uh, scheme, but for all the three problems that I kind of pointed out in the previous slide, we have uh, individual solutions for it. So there's a lot of optimizations uh, in, to get our final result. And at a very high level for the first problem where we have to commit to all these end users, uh, random graphs, we just use a Merkle tree and open to the relevant paths. And this already makes it order log n. And for the second problem, when we have to open to these random values, since they're random values, we can just actually send a random C and create these random, uh, let's say, uh, isomorphisms and permutation from this random C. And now the observation that when this challenge is zero, we only have to send a single C, so it's very light. So in this final um, problem of doing a lot of power repetition, we're gonna fine tune and balance this challenge set so that we use more zero than one. 
So for the full detail, I would like uh, everybody to look at the paper or, or the video. So this is a summary, and uh, this table shows our final implementation of calamari and falafel. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat or, uh, or on Zulip. Uh, so I have one. So, so your uh, trick to reduce the, um, your trick to reduce the, uh, uh, the, the, the size of the, uh, uh, um, of the of the answer of the reply in in case of the challenge zero, uh, so it, it is very compact, uh, but uh, <laughs> it still takes uh, linear time to verify, right? So yes. is, is it, right. so doesn't that make the the, the proof? So it's, it it has compact size, but it's very, it's, it's still relatively expensive to uh, to check the result. Uh, so this part only uses a very, it just expands this uh, PRG seed. So it, it does scale linearly in the number of users, but it is still efficient. Okay. Um, so I have another one maybe. So, um, so I see how uh, the community isogeny setting gives you a, a, a group action. I'm more confused about lattices. So is, are there yeah. lattices in, in, in are group actions in lattices? Uh, so it's like kind of downgrading lattices because uh, essentially you could try to view lattices in a very naive and stupid way and make it into a group action. And it might be ex difficult to explain it by words, but if you look at the actual construction, it's, it's so simple. Okay, thank you. Uh, so since we don't have any other question and we are still a bit over time, so let's move to the next talk. I'm passing the uh, the mic to Stephen. Yeah. Okay. So Walter, do you want to share your screen? So at the, the next talk, yep, yeah, we can see you. The next talk is uh, by Walter Kastrick, Thomas Dacru, and Frederick Fikalteren. Please start. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you. So this is a, a paper called Radical Isogenies, uh, in the joint work with Thomas de Cruy and Friedrich Verkouteren at KU Leuven. And uh, so in this uh, talk, we uh, consider uh, the problem of computing uh, a, a chain of isogenies of some fixed degree R, say. And so this is a, a task that appears in, uh, in basically all isogeny-based protocols, uh, which we'd like to optimize. And so the default approach to performing this task is to, at each step of the iteration, explicitly list um, the points in the kernel of the isogeny and then apply various formulas. So that's like the standard uh, thing you would try. And so for instance, uh, uh, and so, yeah, so the whole observation is that this listing the points in the kernel explicitly uh, may be an expensive step. So that's something we would like to, uh, to get around. And for instance, in a CRSRC site, a typical kernel could be described as uh, the unique FQ rational order R subgroup. And then how do you list the points uh, in that uh, subgroup uh, explicitly? Well, basically, you sample a random point on the elliptic curve, and then you uh, multiply that point with a, a cofactor, a large cofactor, and then you hope that the result has order R. And if it does, then you have found uh, the kernel. But it's, uh, the whole problem is this uh, multiplication with this cofactor. So this is quite expensive. Uh, so this requires to work out, it depends a bit on the model you work with, uh, around 11 log Q uh, field multiplications in FQ. So uh, in this paper, we provide a, an alternative approach. So we basically uh, provide uh, an addendum to values formulae. Namely, we uh, add formulae to that that produce explicitly a generator for, uh, of the kernel for the next isogeny. Okay? So no longer uh, point sampling is needed. And so this large scalar multiplication can be avoided. And our explicit formulae, uh, they are algebraic expressions. Uh, except for the, well, they are algebraic expressions and the most uh, uh, expensive ingredient is uh, the extraction of an art root. And so hence our name, uh, radical isogenies. 
And so instead of giving the general framework, let me illustrate uh, by means of an example, uh, which uh, then uh, gives the general flavor. I include the case R equals four here uh, in Thomas' video. Uh, he did the case R equals five. So you have two examples then. Okay, so we want to compute a chain of four isogenies. I said we can only apply these formulae from the second step onward. So at the first step, we really have to start off with the default methods. So we find a point of order four using such a big scalar multiplication, say. And so once we have found such a point of order four, we can rewrite the pair E0, P0 in Tate normal form. Uh, so that the point P0 becomes the origin. Uh, and then we can apply Velis formulae. And so this gives us an equation uh, for the next curve E1. And then as said, we provide an addendum to this uh, to these formulae. And so in this case, our addendum produces uh, explicit coordinates for the uh, kernel, uh, for, a, for a generator of the, of the next kernel. And so the radical uh, nature here is visible in this alpha. This alpha is a, a fourth root of minus b in this case, and then p1 is an explicit expression uh, in this uh, alpha, okay? Now, how do we use this? Well, let's uh, rewrite everything. So we have uh, our curve E1 obtained from value and this uh, new point P1. Well, now it's convenient to rewrite this uh, pair again in Tate normal form. So to move that point P1 to the origin again. And now we find coefficients of this Tate normal form, which are uh, functions of the coefficients of the original Tate normal form. So in this case, we have a coefficient iota of B, which is an explicit expression in the original B, again, involving this uh, radical, as I said. And this is a function, this is an expression that you can apply iteratively. Okay, so you can compute yota of b, then you can compute yota of yota of b, you have the next curve, then yota of yota of yota of b, and so on. So this is how you uh, compute uh, the chain. Okay, and so in general, we prove that similar formula exists for any r. Uh, in the paper, we elaborate them in detail for r up to 13. Uh, and the radical that has to be computed uh, is an r root of uh, some uh, explicit function uh, that is obtained uh, through the Tate pairing. Okay, so basically you work on the universal Tate normal curve over uh, the function field of, uh, of some modular curve, and then uh, you obtain a function from that, and this is the, the thing of which you want to extract R roots. Now, something I did not say on the previous example is that the R roots are not unique. You have R of them, and you can multiply with uh, roots of unity. And so this corresponds then to uh, walking in all possible R non-backtracking directions, okay? And so there's the problem, of course, still of controlling which direct in, direction in which you are walking. But here's a nice uh, case. So if uh, R and Q minus one are co-prime, then uh, there's a, a very canonical way of extracting an R root, uh, which uh, corresponds to uh, raising your uh, expression of which you want to extract the R root to some, uh, some power, namely the inverse of R modulo Q minus one. And so this is really the, then the correct direction, uh, for instance, in the seaside setting. Uh, and so we have replaced this big scalar multiplication of 11 log Q field multiplications with, uh, with one exponentiation, say, uh, which is uh, about 1.5 log Q field multiplications. Of course, uh, this is only about the root extraction. So this, ignore, this ignores everything else that is in the formulae. And so for big R, these formulae become quite complicated. And so this is no longer an honest uh, comparison. Okay, so in conclusion, um, if we apply this method, uh, then if we just consider the standalone problem of computing a chain of isogenies, then we obtain speed ups of up to a factor 50. This is for a 512 bit uh, prime field. Um, this is for R equals three, but for R equals three, there exist other methods that I didn't mention. So a more honest statement is that we obtain speed ups of up to a factor 27 compared to the best available methods. And then the optimal value is for R equals seven. Uh, if we incorporate this into uh, Seaside, so then we can obtain a variant of Seaside 512 that runs about 19% faster than state of the art. It must be said here that for larger uh, prime fields, uh, which are, uh, are recommended, uh, then the speed up will become a little bit less prominent uh, because the speed up is more in the smallest uh, primes. Um, here are two limitations. So um, in several protocols, one does not explicitly uh, generate a kernel uh, points in the kernel with scalar multiplication, but one obtains kernel points by pushing points through the previous isogeny. And then, so this is notably the case in SIDH, but to some extent, this is also used in, in C site. And then radical isogenies become a bit less uh, competitive. Uh, and then uh, another drawback that I already mentioned is that the formula formally become very complicated as R grows. 
so we only found an advantage uh, in using these formula up to r uh, equals 13 or so. Uh, so they become complicated to use, but also to, to find explicitly. So uh, that's where I'll stop. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. That was a very, um, very beautiful and clear talk. So, I mean, this is, is there any further direction from this or is this really a complete, complete, you've completely developed this uh, line of work, do you think? No, no, there are several open questions. Um, so yeah, one open question is really this thing, how to find these formulae um, explicitly. So now we really have to factor uh, division polynomials over some function field and this becomes very involved. Uh, and so uh, we would like to, uh, to, so we know which, which art route we have to take, but obtaining the concrete formula from, from this uh, is, is, a, is a complicated operation. And for this, we, we really are at a suboptimal uh, approach. Uh, we have the feeling now. So there should be like an explicit way of then writing down the corresponding coordinates for P1, but we don't have this for the moment. Uh, and then another thing is um, that if R and Q minus one are not co-prime, how do we then navigate in a controlled way? So we have some conjecture for if this GCD is two, then um, if the GCD is two um, and, uh, and Q is three mod four, say, then, then you have a, a notion of principles, uh, principle R truth, namely you take one of the, well, uh, you will over over your base field. You will have two R roots then, if the GCD is two, and one of them will be a square, and one of them will be not, uh, in, the, in that setting, because they will be differing by a sign, and uh, and minus one is not a square if Q is three mod four, and so uh, this it seems that you can use this to to navigate also in a control way by by taking the the right selection, and this we understand for R equals two. Uh, and we have a conjectural understanding of this for R equals four, but beyond that, we don't have a, we don't understand it yet. Mm. Um, yeah. mm. And then maybe a final thing is that uh, because you don't have this uh, fail, if you just follow the default approach by uh, multiplying a point by a scalar, you also have a, a failure probability. Uh, whereas here, these formulas are always return. A, a, an exact point. So this seems to be interesting for like constant time implementation type of things. And so we would also like to investigate that. So yeah, we are left with as many open questions as we answered. So. Great. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, I, we don't think we have time for any more questions. I don't see any on the chat. So um, thanks. You can stop sharing and we'll, we'll go on to the next talk, which I think is okay, given by um, Dimitri. Are you there, Dimitri? Yes, hi. Um, I'll share, I'll share my... mm -hmm. <coughs> so This is on uh, oblivious pseudorandom functions from isogenies. Dan Bonnet, Dimitri Kogan, and Catherine Wu. So please start. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, yeah, this is joint work with Katie Wu and Dan Bonnet. Um, so to start off, uh, let me introduce oblivious pseudorandom functions. And oblivious pseudorandom function is a two-party protocol between a client that holds an input X and a server that holds a PRF key K. And at the end of the protocol, the client must learn the value of the PRF on that single input, and the server must learn nothing about the client's input. Uh, furthermore, uh, an OPRF is verifiable if it guarantees consistency across multiple executions. That is, clients should be able to check that the outputs they obtain are all consistent with a single key K to which the server can commit ahead of time. And oblivious PRFs have multiple applications, uh, both as part of larger cryptographic protocols, such as private set intersection, or password authenticated key exchange. And they're also used as part of real world systems. So for instance, Google's password checkup service uses an oblivious PRF and Cloudflare's uh, privacy pass, which is a system to prevent a denial of service attacks, uh, uses an oblivious PRF as a privacy preserving mechanism. And this all these applications mostly use a Diffie-Hellman based oblivious PRF, which has the huge advantage of being both simple and quite efficient. And there are also construction of oblivious PRFs from RSA. But both, both, both types of these constructions, they're uh, not secure against a, a quantum attack. So it's interesting to ask, what about a post-quantum secure oblivious PRF? 
So to construct such an oblivious PRF, one path you could take is to apply a generic solution, such as a post-quantum secure two-party computation protocol to evaluate some symmetric key-based PRFs, such as uh, using AES, for instance. And there's also direct uh, recent construction from uh, lattices. And in our work, we study the question of oblivious PRFs uh, from isogenies. And we give a couple of constructions. Our first construction is a verifiable oblivious PRF in the SIDH setting. Uh, it is secure under typical SIDH type assumptions, as well as a new one more assumption that we introduce in our paper. And we prove security in the random oracle model in the UC framework. An evaluation of this verifiable obli oblivious PRF requires uh, under two megabytes of uh, communication. Our second construction is an oblivious PRF from commutative group actions, and as such can be instantiated uh, using Seaside. Uh, at its core, this, is, uh, uh, this construction is, uh, com combines an Orangold type uh, PRF, which I think actually a couple of other papers in the session also, um, also built similar constructions. And then we combine it with isogeny-based oblivious transfer. That can be that can be built from isogenies uh, fully maliciously uh, from the last couple of years. Uh, this is secure from group action DDH, and even though it only offer, offers sub-exponential security uh, due to Cooperberg's algorithm, the constants here are a little bit better, and so you end up with uh, smaller communi concrete communication. However, this construction uh, is not uh, verifiable uh, in its current in its current form, and in the remainder. In the remainder of this short talk, I want to give you a sketch of our first construction from SIDH. So uh, this construction uh, uses an SIDH type setup generalized to more than two primes. So uh, for starters, think about uh, uh, three, three prime powers, which we're going to color code. And this allows us to evaluate uh, isogenies of three different uh, smooth degrees, uh, blue, green, and red. So fixing some starting curve E0, as well as basis for the three torsion groups, to evaluate the oblivious PRF on a point X, the client first computes a blue isogeny whose kernel is determined by hashing the input, uh, the input X. It then further applies a, a random red isogeny that serves the purpose of blinding uh, that curve E of X. Uh, it then computes the uh, images of the, uh, of the green torsion basis under these is isogenies, as well as publishes a new basis uh, for the blinding red torsion and sends all this information to the server. The server then uses, uh, uses its secret key K in order to compute a green isogeny whose kernel is determined by the secret key. And it sends back to the client the resulting curve, as well as the images of this red blinding torsion under the secret isogeny. Notice that the server at, at any point does not reveal the action of its secret isogeny on the blue or the green torsions, which prevents the client from learning the value of the oblivious PRF on more than one point in a single execution under a suitable assumption. And then finally, the client can apply the translation of the dual of the blinding isogeny uh, on the curve it obtains from the server in order to obtain the curve EXK, which is then hashes to obtain the PRF output. So as presented, this, this sketch is not, is not secure. And the reason is that um, there, there could be active attacks on this protocol. So the first type of attack is that the malicious client can send uh, crafted, uh, crafted torsion points in order to extract additional information about the secret key uh, and break security. And second, the malicious server doesn't have to behave consistently and so uh, can respond using different keys in different executions. And to solve both these problems, we developed two uh, zero custom zero knowledge protocols that basically enforce that bo both parties behave honestly. Um, now the caveat is that both these zero knowledge protocols are, are basically uh, repetitions of a basic pro of, of base of kind of sub protocols that provide only constant soundness error, which drives up the total communication of our protocol. And this is the main communication bottleneck. Um, so to conclude. I'll just mention the two, two open problems. The first is that um, trying to improve those zero knowledge proofs, which are uh, currently the bottleneck. And second is try to maybe obtain a threshold variant and oblivious PRF, which is useful because it allows splitting the keys between multiple servers. And I'll just mention that in our paper, we develop also a new abstraction for SIDH-like constructions we call augmentable commitments. And I invite you to look at it because it could be useful in other SIDH-like constructions and simplify uh, proof writing and descriptions. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Cool. Thank you, Dimitri. That's uh, 
very nice uh, clear talk. So um, coming back to the, the efficiency of the zero knowledge proof, I mean, it seems very related to trying to get efficient signatures from, from SIDH. Do you want to sort of comment on that connection? Um, yeah, so b b I think the, the, the similarity is in fact that the, uh, if we could prove knowledge of isogeny without having to repeat uh, multiple times, then this could, uh, this, this obviously using Fiat Charmier could get us efficient signatures. I think one possible path that uh, this problem in our case is slightly easier is that we can actually be satisfied with private keys protocols. And in fact, one of our two protocols, the one that kind of proves the quality of two isogenies, kind of a D, um, uh, Shawn Peterson style proof uh, for, for DDH, but for isogenies, this does use private, key, pri private coins. So this doesn't, which private coin doesn't result in signatures, but is sufficient to get an interactive protocol for an OPRF. So uh, I guess that's maybe one, one, one direction that could, uh, could be interesting. Mm, interesting. There's also a, a comment on, um, on the uh, Zoom chat from all the Zulip from um, uh, Luca DeFeo about the, the unbalance, the fact you're using, I mean, we talked about this by email previously, the fact you have the, the setting the points and the multiple primes. So do you want to just talk a little bit about the security? Yeah, so um, I think the issue, the, the issue here is that there are multiple um, uh, m multiple uh, papers that show basically that as you increase the number of uh, of prime powers that you when you're building your prime, uh, you need to be careful not to reveal the action of some secret isogeny on too large on too large of a kind of a portion of this of this product that you're building up. Um, if if I'm if uh, unless I, I think that's maybe what uh, what you what Luca and you are referring to, um, so I think current attacks are kind of just above uh, they they don't quite reach the to be problematic for our case because they kind of require you to reveal um, uh, on a on a super linear size of a portion of the of the torsion whereas we are try to be careful and only basically basically reveal on sub on on smaller fractions of the entire uh, of the entire group. Mm. Um, so we did try to look at it, but um, yeah, I guess this is one thing that need to be worried that improvements in these attacks don't, uh, don't break this type of assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's great. All right, cool, thank you. We'd better move on to the, the final talk so you can stop sharing, please. And um, I think it's uh, Tomoki Moriya is here. Great, Hello. since the last, last talk is on uh, Sigamal. And this is uh, by um, yeah, Tomoki Moriya, Hiroshi Oniki, and Tsuyoshi Takagi. So please start. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tomoki Moriya. The title of my presentation is Sigamo, a super singular isogeny based PKE and its application to a PLF. And this is the main results uh, of our study. First, we propose the new isogeny based PKE schemes, Sigamo and Sisigamo. And these schemes have in-CPA security without using hack functions. And moreover, we constructed an outline of type pseudorandom function based on Sigma. And this pseudorandom function is constructed without using hash functions. And today, I explain the construction of Sigma and Sigma and their security. And this is the main idea of Sigma. Uh, first, I'll just compute a this group action. And here, uh, RP0 is a image point of P0 under this isogeny. And Alice, I'll put these two sets as a public key. And next, Bob computes uh, these two actions. And Bob also compute the multiplication of mu and bear P0. And he outputs uh, these two sets as a ciphertext. And now let's compute this group action and see get RB0 and RBP0. And by solving this group algorithm problem, I'll just get the secret message mu. If these points have smooth order by using Polk Hellman algorithm, I can easily compute the secret message mu. And this is the main idea of Sigma. And here's the construction. First, we take P as this equation and let P0 be a point over order 2 to L, define it over FB. And this is public key, and this is secret key. And the print mu is embedded in a group of units of Z over 2 to L Z. And this is cipher text, and here is the point. And in description, I will compute RB0 and RBP0, and by using Polkheimer algorithm, 
C computes the message mu. Uh, this is a construction of sigma. And C C gamma is a compression version of C gamma. Uh, first, I will compute this group action and she output these two set as a public key. And next, Bob computes these two actions. And he also computes uh, this point. Here, this group point is a point which has order two to R and define it over FB. And Alice and Bob publicly shared the algorithm which generates this group point. Uh, there are many algorithms like this. For example, algorithm which outputs a point which has smallest x coordinate among meeting among the points meeting the conditions. And by solving this group algorithm problem, Bob gets mu star. By this computation, Bob compressed the information of these two sets to mu star. And Bob computes the multiplication of mu star and by p0, and he sent to Iris this set as a ciphertext. And Alice computes this group action, and she also computes this proof point. The next, by solving this green algorithm problem, Alice gets the secret message mu. Uh, this is a construction of CC gamma. And here's a comparison of C gamma and CC gamma. And as shown in this table, uh, CC gamma is a compression version of C gamma. The next, I explain the security of these uh, schemes. First, we define a new assumption, a PCSSDDH assumption. A PCSSDDH assumption claims any PPT algorithm cannot distinguish the distributions of these set. The first set is a correct a set of correct commutative diagram. And in second set, the last point, uh, final point becomes a random point. And here is one stellum. If P, C, S, D, H assumption holds, and then C gamma and C, C gamma had in CPA security. And this is a comparison with other PT schemes. Uh, SID, HC side have in CPA security, but uh, they use the hash functions. And set that does not use hash functions but its security is one-way CPA. So uh, in this meaning, uh, C gamma and CC gamma are more secure than these PKE schemes. And thank you for listening. My presentation is over. Thank you for your presentation. I don't know if there's any questions, but first I'll ask something. So I'm a little bit confused about the fact you're, you're using discrete log. So is this post-quantum or is this not post-quantum? Uh, I, I think it is a, ah, uh, by a uh, discrete problem it can easily solve because uh, the order of these points are smooth, uh, two to R. So, uh, and, uh, okay, uh, okay. And this is maybe a post-quantum because uh, uh, this, uh, it, it is hard to solve this assumption is true, but uh, if you don't know that uh, this uh, under the isogen I isogeny uh, among these elliptic curves, you cannot uh, compute uh, this point. So uh, I think these schemes are post quantum. Yeah, so can you actually give them a slightly more precise, a, a, briefly a precise explanation of exactly what is the action of the, of the ideal A on the point P0? Uh, this is a, a image point of uh, mm -hmm. P0 and uh, I'll just compute that this isogeny and uh, image point of this P0. And what's the relation between the order of the point and the degree of the isogeny? Uh, I did, order of the, this isogeny is the, uh, uh, the uh, this order is uh, two to L and the uh, order of this isogeny is, is the, uh, the same, uh, this one, so uh, um, L1, L1 mm -hmm. to E1, two to L1, two E1. So the, uh, this is a prime, uh, co prime to the, the degree of isogeny and of this point. 
I will uh, let Mehdi, you can, you can ask your own question. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly confused also by the construction. So, so it seems like your, so the, your, your um, uh, hardness assumption in particular implies that, uh, so you have a, a, a generator of um, a group of smooth order and you're you're saying that uh, this this generator is indistinguishable from uh, a random multiple of that generator. But the problem is, so in general, this this cannot happen because uh, with a significant probability, say in, in this case with probably one half, the uh, the order of uh, the multiple. Ah, so okay, so you you're assuming that uh, k is invertible. Yes. Mm, okay. Okay. I, I missed that. Sorry. Yeah, I missed it too, but I see it. I can see it now. Cool. Are there any other questions from the audience? All right. Well, we, we caught up on time from Craig, who always talks too much. So I thank all the speakers for the session. Thanks very much. It's great that there were so many nice misogyny papers submitted to AsiaCrypt. I'm very pleased with that. Keep up the